are those nusus which are mulzima or fiha ilzam. Yeah, they need to bind you by something, yeah? If it said that you're mulzam and I am the mulzim or bainana ilzam, it's what I've done. Afun akhi. Done this. Can't go nowhere. I'm bound by him, yeah? Taib. So we have those nusus which are mulzima. We're bound by what's in them. Yeah? Taib, ma'ana? For example, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has came in the hadith. إِذَا ذُكِرَ أَصْحَابِي فَأَمْسِكُوا If my companions are mentioned, then remain silence. The context obviously here, if, that, if my sahaba are being mentioned in a bad way, then with regards to your woman folk. If you are a true man, then you would not even think about laying your hand, even thinking about it towards your wife, even if she angers you. Because this does not prove that you're a man, but rather it proves you're a coward. So you should fear Allah Azza wa Jal. It has to stop this abuse that goes on in the household, not just because of the fact that you're literally breaking this woman. It's not just that, but specifically more even when you have children in the household. Because now you're making them grow up in this toxic environment. So we have to bear in mind and know that we should be kind towards our women folk. يا طالب العلم قم لتنم فإن الزمان انقضى وانصرم فكن ما حييت ضنينا به فظنك بالوقت عين الكرم وكن حلس درسك وافرح به تكن قائدا في غد للأمم وبادر شبابك من قبل أن يقطع عزمك سيف الحرم and we're starting off with the rights of the Sahara. And it's going to be read by, or the lecture is going to be held by our brother, Billah Usama Hills, who's a graduate from Kulit al Hadith. And then afterwards, we're going to have the lecture on the rights of the spouses by our brother, Abdullah Khamis Ali Gandhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina wa man yahdihi allaha wa man yahdihi allahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiya lah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa allah wa ahduhu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Today, my brothers, inshallah, during this time that we've got, um, we're going to be discussing a right from the rights of Islam. Those rights or that right that we're going to be discussing is from those rights that without it or without acknowledging it in the correct way, then it is feared that your Islam is at the very least not correct. And we're going to be looking also into some of the principles and some of those rights which underpin that foundation we're going to be discussing within this liqa, inshallah. That right being, as the brother mentioned, the haqq sahaba or the huquq of the sahaba and as is the ada or the way of ahl al ilm the contemporary the contemporary 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 scholars is that usually they will begin by briefly discussing what is meant by the title heading so what do we mean when we say haqq sahaba or the Hukuk of the Sahaba. The term Haq, um, as is well known by all of us, 
is commonly referred to meaning truth. And this is the way Ahlul Ilm, the scholars of the Arabic language in particular, have defined the term Haqq. Ibn al Mandur, he mentions in Lisan al Arab, in defining the word Haqq linguistically, that he says Haqq huwa diddul batil, that Haqq is the opposite to falsehood. And it is plural is huqaq or huquq. And then he elaborates further and he also mentions a number of meanings and if from them or from the meanings of the word haq is to be unequivocal in clarity. As it relates to the term Sahabi or Sahaba, then linguistically, the scholars have mentioned that the term Sahaba linguistically refers to anybody having accompanied somebody else or being closely associated to them. And it's an important point that they also mentioned that it is not a condition within the term Sahaba or Sahabi that time is a factor. So for somebody to have ever been considered as a companion or a Sahabi of somebody else, then it doesn't necessarily mean that they had to have spent a long time with them or a short time with them. And we find this is the case with some of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And they are Sahaba Bil Ijma. They are Sahaba by consensus, yet they only met the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for a moment, or some of them only even seen him, never even met him. Yet they are considered to be Sahaba. Ibn Hajrim, Hafidhullah, he mentions as it relates to the term Sahaba in his book Tamiz, he mentions as Sahaba Mushtaqun min as Suhba. In terms of the word, it's a word which is taken from the word suhbah. It's taken from the word suhbah. وَلَيْسَ مُشْتَقًا مِنْ قَدْرٍ خَاصٍ فَهُوَ جَارٍ عَلَى كُلِّ مَنْ سَحِبَ غَيْرُهُ كَلِيلًا أَوْ كَثِيرًا That is sahaba, the word sahaba, linguistically, it is used for every. It is used for everybody who took somebody else as a companion, whether it was for a short amount of time or a small amount of time. Is that clear? Khair, inshallah. In terms of the word Sahabi or the Sahaba with Ahlul Ilm, the technical definition, when the scholars somewhat have differed in their ibarat or uh, expressions as to what or who a Sahabi is. They have their own factors as to who, or based upon, who is considered to be a Sahabi. But the most, the Raja, or the best saying as it relates to who the Sahabi is, definitively, or in terms of its definition, is the saying of Ibn Hajar, where he says that the Sahabi, man laqiya nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever met the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when we say met, it doesn't necessarily mean that they had to have seen him. They could have been blind. Yeah? Like Ibn Um, Muktum, blind, but he's Sahabi. Yeah? So when we say Luqiyah or met, we mean being, they adraku, they somewhat uh, came across the Messenger of Allah, Alaihi Wasallam. Mu'minan bihi, and they believed in him. And they believed him in him. Wa mata al Islam, and they died upon Islam. 
due to time we can't get into the details of the ta'rif and what enters in and what doesn't but the sahabi or for somebody to can be considered a sahabi then we have three things luqiyah that they met the messenger of Allah so we say met loosely yeah we say met loosely believed in him and died upon that sahabi Taib. And this was the position of the elites or the major scholars of hadith such as Bukhari and Ahmed and other than them. As Bukhari mentioned in his Sahih, he says, Babun Fadlus Fadlu Ashabi Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Waman Sahibuhu Waman Ra'ahu min al Muslimin Fuhua min Ashabihi. He says the chapter of those who, or the chapter, or the, the virtues of the Sahaba, yeah, and those who accompanied the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or seen him, then they are from the companions, as Bukhari said in his Sahihul Jami'. Yeah. So the correct position is that they don't necessarily have to have come in close proximity, proximity to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's enough that they seen him and they're considered as to being Sahabi. Yeah? طيب. As it relates to the hukuk of the Sahaba or entering into that discussion as it relates to the hukuk of Sahaba, then what do we mean by hukuk of Sahaba as it relates to us? How do we give our rights to the Sahaba? Then the scholars that they mention, in general, they say that. Our position or our iman or our belief as it relates to the Zahaba, it is al i'tiqadu wal iqtida'u to have belief and good practice. Fi ma nukila anis Sahaba fi kitabillah. In regards to that which has been reported about the Sahaba in the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَفِي سُنَّةِ النَّبِيِّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Or in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فِي ضَوْءِ فَهْمِ السَّلِفِ الصَّالِحِ In light of the understanding, light of, the understanding of the righteous Salaf In general Our stance is in general that we have Iman, اعتقاد and good practice as it relates to the Sahaba Yeah Internally and externally Yeah In our belief and in our actions Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he elaborated or gave some insight into what this means Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he gave a little bit of insight into what do we mean by iman and i'tiqad good practice and belief so he says in the book that we, the book that we all know al-aqidat al-wasitiyah he said min usuli ahli sunnati wal jama'ah from the foundations of the people of the sunnah from the must from the foundations of the muslim the real muslim yeah salamu to al sinitihim li ashabi rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that their tongues are safe in regards to the companions of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kama wasafahum allah ta'ala fi kitabihi fi masaq al ayat as Allah Azza wa Jal described them in his book when he mentions the ayat. Taib, question. Did Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah specifically mean, or did he only mean that our tongues only are supposed to have good adab and good conduct with the Sahaba? Did he mean the tongue only? No. He mentioned the, he mentioned the tongue, minbabi taghlib. He mentioned the tongue. Why? Because it's the tongue, for the most part, that people use to speak badly about the Sahaba. It's the tongue. But he didn't only mean the tongue. Yeah? It could be an action. It could be an action. So if a person hears the mention of Abu Bakr as Sadiq, radiyahu ta'ala anhu, he turns his face, cuts his face, Abu Bakr. Yeah? Or Umar. Yeah, is that good adab with the Sahaba? Is that la? This yatabar and this is considered a form of ta'am and belittling the Sahaba as well. Yeah, is that clear? Taib. So, 
the point being that from here we understand, especially from the saying of Shaykh al-Islam, that it is not enough that we just simply have <coughs> ma'rifah of the Sahaba. Just mere ma'rifah, just mere knowledge. Yeah, the, 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 the messenger of Allah, so the messenger of the Prophet Muhammad, he had a bunch of men that used to accompany him. You know, this is not our attitude as it relates to the Sahaba. Yeah? Rather, we have to have the correct principles which underpin this origin, this asul, this foundation, huwa, which is the mawqi for the correct stance as it relates to the Sahaba. There's principles which that by way of them, our belief and our stance as it relates to the Sahaba is correct. Is that clear? We can't have iman or say, you know, or, you know, say that we believe that the Sahab... No, we have, there are principles which straighten and make correct our stance as it relates to the Sahaba. And this is with every asul and every religion as it relates to the aqidah in the religion. Because some of the usul of Islam in and of themselves were mentioned generally do not differentiate between haq and batil or the people of haq and the people of batil. So, for example, if a person says, "Uminu billah," I believe in Allah. I believe in this asul. And then you say, "So do I." What's the difference between them? There's no difference between them. It is only within the details of the origin that we begin to understand what the correct position is from what isn't so if we find this individual for example saying i believe in allah but yet in the same breath he says that he believes that the asma and the sifat of allah azawajal are mujazi metaphoric yeah he doesn't believe in allah like you yeah so we have to understand what the principles are that are within the origin to understand what the correct position is as it relates to any foundation within the religion and this one is not an exception yeah طيب, what is the mawqif of the Muslim? what is the mawqif or the position of the Muslim as it relates to the Sahaba? this is our first principle our first right yeah that haqq al i'tiqadi yeah, our first right. What is our mawqif as it relates to the Sahaba? In explanation of that which is preceded. Then Ibn Hajar al Asqalani he says, he says that the Sahaba are not the subject of scrutiny. The Sahaba are not the subject of scrutiny. Neither is their integrity. Meaning that the Sahaba. When we hear of the Sahaba, we don't go about researching them. You know, let me just see if Abu Bakr is trustworthy. Let me just crack open some books and find out if Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is trustworthy. All of the Sahaba are free from this. All of the Sahaba are free from scrutiny and bath. So Ibn Hajari continues, and he said that this here is with consensus of all of the ulama based upon the book of Allah Azawajal and the son of the messenger of Allah Azawajal. in summary what he's saying that all of the sahaba are adul all of the sahaba are adul all of the sahaba are trustworthy all of the sahaba are trustworthy so we don't need to find out so sometimes we come across those ahadith and it could be said haddathani rajalun min ashabin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do we need to find out who that is? We don't need to find out who that is. As long as we've affirmed that the isnad is muqtasil and connected. Huh? And there's some other yeah, there's some, some details as well as to who the, who the tabi' is, who's saying it and so on. Yeah? But in general, the qa'idah is, if I ubhima sahabi, we don't need to find out who it is. Huh? As Ahlul Hadith used to say, that ibhamu sahaba la yutur. That the ibham or the non-naming of a sahabi in the hadith does not affect anything. Yeah, we don't need to find out who he is. 
So we find that this haqq and this belief of the, of the Sahaba, we find that Ahlul Hadith applied it within their amaliyya. They applied it within their practical research in knowledge. They applied it. Sahabi, not named, no problem. Khatib al Baghdadi, al Hafif, al Khatib al Baghdadi, he says in Al Kifaya, he has a chapter where he says, Babun qawlu tabi'i that the saying of the tabi'i haddathani rajulun min ashabi nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hal yukunu thalika hujja the chapter of when a tabi'i everybody knows who's a tabi'i sir? tabi'i yeah? those who took from the sahaba yeah? the chapter of the saying of the tabi'i that a man from the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, narrated to me هل يكون ذلك حجة is that hadith a proof? I've already mentioned some afar in that regard and from them it's the author of Ibn al-Athram yeah where he asked Imam Ahmed this question what if a man says حدثني رجل من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هل يكون ذلك حجة فقال أحمد نعم is that hadith a proof? Imam Ahmed said Yes, we don't need to know who that Sahaba is. Yeah, why? Because all of the Sahaba are trustworthy. Adul. Yeah. Khatib al Baghdadi, he further elaborates on this point here that all of the Sahaba are Adul. Yeah, it's an important principle. Why? Because we're living in a time where the attack is on. The attack is on against the Sahaba. You see what the Rafid and all these people out here are doing. The attack is on. Yeah? We're going to get to that, inshallah, in somewhat details. But Khatib al Baghdadi, he mentions Babun. He says, Ma ja'a fi ta'dili lahi wa rasulihi lis Sahaba. Wa annuhu la yahtaj ilo su'alin anhum. Wa inna ma yajibu thalika fi man dunahum. He says, The chapter of that which has come. As it relates to the complete praise of Allah Azza wa Jal for the Sahaba and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the Sahaba. Yeah? And that they are not in need of being questioned. Their integrity is not in need of being researched. And that is only an affair which is binding for, for those who are other than the Sahaba. Yani fi in a level lower than them. Yeah? He mentions وَكُلَّ حَدِيثٍ إِتَّصَلَ إِسْنَادُهُ بَيْنَ مَنْ رَوَاهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said every hadith where it's isnad is connected from the one who narrated it to the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says لَمْ يَلْزِمِ الْعَمَلُ بِهِ إِلَّا بَعْدَ ثَبُوتِ عَدَالَةِ رِجَالِهِ He says that it's not binding to act upon that hadith until we know who every single person in that isnad is. Yeah? وَيَجِبُ النَّذْرُ فِي أَحْوَالِهِمْ سِوَى الصَّحَابَةِ And it is wajib that we look into the state of every single person in that isnad except for the Sahaba. And then he goes on to mention. He says, لِأَنَّ عَدَالَةَ الصَّحَابَةِ ثَابِتَةٌ مَعْلُومَةٌ بِتَعْدِيلِ اللَّهِ He says, why? Because the adala and the trustworthiness and the level of the Sahaba is known and established by who? By who? By Allah Azza wa Jal in His Quran. Yeah? In His Quran. So there's no need to question their integrity and who they are. Allah Azza wa Jal, He's the one that praised them. He further mentions and he elaborates on this further. We'll finish, we'll finish what Khatib says on this point here. He says, والأخبار في هذا المعنى تتسع. He says أن أخبار أن أحاديث أن آيات النص هي they're plentiful, plentiful. He says وكلها مطابقة لما ورد في نص القرآن. And he says all of these texts, these hadith and these آثار are all of them are perfectly in line with what is mentioned in the Quran about them. About them in regards to what? 
So he says, وَجَمِعُ ذَلِكَ يَقْتَدِي طَحَارَةِ الصَّحَابَةِ And he says, all of those nusuls, all of them demand and inform that the Sahaba were pure, without doubt. And that Allah Azza wa Jal has removed them from any blame or them from being blamed for these praiseworthy things. Then he says, فَلَا يَحْتَاجُ أَحَدٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَ تَعْدِيلِ اللَّهِ So he says, none of them are in need of the praise of anybody else with the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal from the... So he says that after the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal for them, then the Sahaba are not in need of the praise of anybody else. Point being, the Adal of the Sahaba is a babun which is mughlaq, red line, yeah? It's closed. Taib. We heard Al Khatib, he mentioned that he says, Well, Akbar of Fihava Tessir. He said that the akhbar and the afar and the ayat and hadith, all of them are, yani they're plentiful as it relates to the, the sahaba and their level, who they are. طيب. As it relates to the proofs in regards to the sahaba and our stance as it relates to the sahaba, and our rights of the Sahaba over us in terms of believing them correctly and so on then the proofs the proofs as it relates to the Sahaba as a mawdu' a general subject of two types yeah we have those Proofs and those adilla, those ayat and those ahadith, which are in relation to the aslul mas'ala or the usulul mas'ala, those textual evidences which are in connection to the foundation itself. And the foundation that we're talking about here is the Sahaba and their trustworthiness. Yeah? That foundation is the head foundation. Yeah, and that's why it's called an asul, a foundation. Yeah, so we have those ayat and those ahadith which are in connection to this asul, and they're the ones that we're going to try and discuss because we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, so we're going to mention some of them, and then we have those texts, those textual evidences which are in connection to, yani, uh, what they call the uh, the furur, yeah, or the farul masala, or the furur. Of the of the usul, those issues that branch off from the origin. So we're talking about things like khilafa, bain sahaba, wa tafawut, wa tafawut. Yani the subsidiary issues. Yeah. Taib. As it relates to those nusus and those texts about the aslul mas'ala or the asul itself, the foundation of the sahaba, then there are three types. Three types. Important point here, because now we, we can be, we can begin to understand how Ahlul Ilm, how the people of knowledge, use these texts to establish this asul. Yeah, we understand how Ahlul Ilm use these texts to understand this asul. So the texts in this regard were three types. Those. And when we talk about texts, we're talking about the relationship of the texts as it relates to the principle, yeah? The text and their relation to the principle or the foundation. So we say that all of the Sahaba are adul. Huh? We say, well, what's your delil? And such, you know, they mention the delil, but we need to understand what the relationship is between the foundation and the the lead, the nas, will be from the Quran or from the Sunnah. So the first one, the first delil are those nusus which are mutabaqah. Those nusus which are 
mutabaka, meaning that they perfectly align with the meaning of the foundation. Yeah, we say the foundation is what? All of the Sahaba are adul. Allah says in the Quran, Azza wa Jal, was sabiqoon, al awwaloon, min al muhajirin, wal ansar, ah, wal ladhina tabi'uhum bi ihsan, radi Allahu anhum wa radu an. Yeah, the first and the foremost from the muhajirin and ansar and those who follow them, that Allah Azza wa Jal is ever pleased with them and they are ever pleased with Allah Azza wa Jal. Taib, is Allah Azza wa Jal pleased with the one who's not adul? Is Allah Azza wa Jal pleased with the one that has no integrity in general? No. So, with the, so for the Sahaba, I mean, Bab Awla, that he is pleased with them. So we can see that this total praise of the Sahaba by Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran totally aligns with the meaning of the origin. Is everybody with that, inshallah? Yeah? Taib. First type of proof. The second one. Are those no source, which whether they're from the Quran or the Sunnah, which are mutadamina, mutadamina, those texts, which they don't necessarily align perfectly in terms of the meaning, but we can see within the text itself that it comprises of the meaning of the foundation. Yeah? Got it? Yeah? I'll give you an example. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in his book, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا And if they believe, who's the mukhatab, who's the one being addressed here? The Sahaba, as well as the Messenger Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba. If they believe how you believe, then they are guided. Yeah? Allah Azza wa Jalla, he's happy with guidance, isn't he? Taib. In this, how does this, what's this verse got to do with what we're talking about? How, how does it include or comprise praise for the Sahaba? Allah Azza wa Jal, he made or he mentioned in this verse that the basis of guidance is who? The messenger said, and who? Because he said, fi'in amanu, jama, plural. So he's not just talking to the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who else is he talking to? He's talking to the sahaba. So Allah Azza wa Jal, he made the basis of hidayah in this verse here, who? The sahaba. It's not that a praise. Huh? And what did Allah Azza wa Jal say in the part of the verse after that? Or into wallow, in the mahum, fi shiqaq. And if they yani, turn their backs on you and abandon you, then they are in hardship. Yeah? This is from the highest levels of praise that Allah Azza wa Jal made the Sahaba the basis of hidayah. And the one who opposes them is misguided. So we can see within this, within this verse, it comprises of. Yatadamman the rida and the ta'deel of Allah Azza wa Jal for the Sahaba. Ma'ana inshallah, yeah? Khair. The third type. Are those nusus which are mulzima or fiha ilzam. Yani to bind you by something, yeah? If it said that you're mulzam and I am the mulzim or bainana ilzam, it's was I've done. Afun akhi. Done this. Can't go nowhere. I'm bound by him, yeah? Taib. So we have those nusus which are mulzima. We're bound by what's in them. Yeah? Taib. Ma'ana? For example, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has came in a hadith. إِذَا ذُكِرَ أَصْحَابِي فَأَمْسِكُوا If my companions are mentioned, then remain silent. The context obviously here 
if that if my sahaba are being mentioned in a bad way then remain silent طيب, what is the wajj or what if the what is the angle of ilzam in this hadith here how are we bound to believe that in this hadith here is a praise for the sahaba anyone want to give it a shot Yeah, no doubt, but how? Time. The Messenger of Allah said, If I look at us, Habi, for Emsiko, this here is a command to do what? To stay silent about the Sahaba. So it is understood from that. Huh? Speak good about them. Mafhumul Makhalafa. Opposite understanding. So while we are Muslim and we are bound by. The opposite of that command or that prohibition, if you like, which is only to speak good about the Sahaba. Daib. Second principle. Is to remain silent and not to make mention of the shortcomings of the Sahaba to remain silent and not to mention the shortcomings of the Sahaba in accordance to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam La tusubbu ashabi Do not berate and do not belittle my companions Taib. Just going back to the Quran a moment because we've, we've, we've basically killed off the time. I want to start. Then I just want to mention a fa'idah as to why Allah Azza wa Jal picked this group of men. Yeah? Why did Allah Azza wa Jal pick this? These specific people. Why, why did he pick Abu Bakr? Why did he pick Umar? Why did he pick Uthman and Ali and so on? Rhetorical question, inshallah. <laughs> yeah? Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَتَا لِتَكُونُ الشُّهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيُكُونَ الرُّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا That we have made you the balanced nation and we have made you witnesses over the people. And we have made the Messenger of Allah some witnesses over you. Yeah? No doubt the Sahaba entered this, into, into this verse. The Khulan Awali and Minbab Awala by default. Ibn Hajr al Asqalani mentions a beautiful benefit about the verse. He says, Wusta in the verse. He said, It means the best of the best and the Adul. Yeah, and they are the best of nations and the most balanced in their sayings and their actions and their intentions. And he said, It was a right that the companions were chosen as witnesses for the Messenger of Allah وسلم, upon all of them, all nations on the day of judgment. He says. And ultimately, due to them being witnesses for Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah Azza wa Jal has raised the Sahaba and praised them. And for this reason, Allah Azza wa Jal informed the angels about the Sahaba and ordered them to give salutations upon the Sahaba and to supplicate for them and to seek forgiveness for them. And he says the reality of this affair, the reality of Allah Azza wa Jal picking a Sahaba. Why? He says the reality of this affair is that the one that Allah Azza wa Jal or that group whom Allah Azza wa Jal has appointed to be a witness which is accepted by him, then they are only the ones who testify with knowledge. And with truth. 
with knowledge and with truth. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal picked the Sahaba. I think we have to do finish there, inshallah. Yeah. Subhanakallah, wa hamdika, wa ashadu an la ilaha ant, wa astaghfirullah, wa tuhu bilik. Afwan. Shall we kill the time? بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللسامعين ولجميع المسلمين أجمعين I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make this a beneficial gathering and to make it from those that are sincere and a gathering that will testify for us Yawm al-Qiyam, Yawm al-Layam, 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 Yawm al because of course it concerns the matter relating to the household the matter that relates with regards to the household now we know of course without a doubt similar to the heart if the heart كما جاء الحديث الصحيح which we all know that إذا صلح القلب صلح الجسد كله meaning if the heart is sound then of course without a doubt the rest of the body will be sound okay and we know this brothers and sisters that if your heart is sound then the rest of the body is going to be sound so similarly if that household is sound, meaning built upon the deen and ikhlas and justice and love and mahabba and mawadda, then the rest of the country will be sound. Meaning there will be islah fil mujtama in the society and in the dawla, in the country. And how can, us, how can this topic not be important when we know that it relates to a matter that concerns men and women, husband and wife, children? And just like the hadith, the opposite of it, meaning if the heart is corrupt, then the rest of the body will be corrupt. So similarly, brothers and sisters, that if the household is corrupt, is built upon cheating and lies and oppression and abuse physically, mentally, then of course the rest of the mujtama will be corrupt. And this is something that we don't even need to think deeply about. It's just basics. If the house is corrupt, then the rest of society will be corrupt. And we know, walillah alhamdul minna, that our beautiful religion of Islam is a religion of mercy and it's a deen of rights. And there is nothing good for us, as we mentioned yesterday, except that the Prophet sallallahu has informed us and it is mentioned in the Quran and nothing sharp or evil for us or that will harm us except that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions it in his book and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has informed us. Allah mentions in the Quran اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا ورضيت لكم أي أنتم أيها المسلمون So you have been blessed with this beautiful religion that Allah has completed يوم عرفة on that specific day that موقف when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم recited the ayah عمر بن خطاب بدأ أن يبكي He started to cry and weep because he knew that yes the deen has been perfected and completed but afterwards would come what? نقصان Deficiencies. Now, because of this, alhamdulillah, the rights that spouses have upon each other, it is within the deen of Islam. Islam takes great importance with regards to this affair of the rights of the spouse. As Allah mentions in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَعَ فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا Meaning, Marry from those that you can with regards to women. Mathna or thulatha or ba, two or three or four, and if you can't be just, then marry one. So this is showing us how Islam has seen or has touched upon the importance of marrying within the doing the nikah and marrying and having a spouse. As the Prophet also mentions in an authentic hadith, 
يا معشر يا معشر الشباب من استطاع منكم الباء فليتزوج ومن لم يستطع فعليه بالصوم فإنه أغض للبصر وأحسن للفرج كما جاء في الحديث أو young youth when he spoke to the youth and he said to them instructing them okay and encouraging them to marry whoever can do so and has the capabilities to marry meaning you have the provisions you have the capability and you're responsible enough then you should go ahead and practice this sunnah that, that the Prophet Sallallahu did which was to marry and whoever cannot do so then he should fast because verily it protects one's private part and it protects you and it keeps the chastity so all of these ayat and this hadith it shows us the importance of marriage ayin nikah that it completes and it makes a society yukmil al mujtama' literally it completes it okay as Allah mentions in the Quran وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا And amongst his signs is that he has created for you wives from amongst yourselves that you may find repose and in them and what? And he has put between you affection لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ not just that, not that you find repose in them only, but also he has put between you, spouses, affection and mercy. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us already from the rights that each spouse has over each other is that you should live with each other with regards to love and affection and rahmah, okay? And also affection. Verily in, in that, i.e. in this specific thing that Allah is telling each and every single one of us, are indeed signs for people, which type of people? People that reflect. So marriage is not just something that is built upon feelings only, or attractions. It is more than that, brothers and sisters. It's not just fairy tales. Maybe many of us, unfortunately, we think that today. Brothers and sisters, that it's just fairy tales. I'm going to get married, it's just a fairy tale. It is more than just a fairy tale, brothers. Yes, maybe the first couple of months, as you know, we know that it says, you know, the honeymoon period meaning the period that the non-muslims say is honeymoon meaning when you first just began to live with each other it's going to be all love and blossom and happiness but it's not just that there's more to it there's responsibilities involved okay there's amana there's you guys coming together a man and a woman people of two different genders coming together to live in one household so it's not just the attraction it's not just the feelings it's not just that fairy tale, it's more than that. You're trying to build a household upon Islam so that inshallah you can have offsprings that will be able to carry out the legacy and also do the same. Now brothers and sisters, we have to bear in mind and realize that these types of relationships, specifically that which the Messenger وسلم, taught us how to do, there are rights that both sides have upon each other. Okay, unfortunately we live in a day and age where a lot of brothers, unfortunately, or husbands, they think that the rights that they have over their wives are the only things. And the, wife, the wives have no rights. This is wrong. But rather, there is both sides have rights. And that's why, unfortunately, in the society that we live in today, the reason why there is a lot of cases of divorce is because they don't know each other's rights that they have upon each other and the opposite as well. But if one understands this, studies this, implements it within his day-to-day -day life, living with his spouse, whether sister living with the husband or brother living with the wife, then it will save a lot of problems that we have today. A lot of problems will be saved. Now, we're going to touch on a couple of things. A lot of people just think that they have rights, meaning once they are married and living with each other. The rights begin way before that, brothers. Way before that, sisters. Way, way before that. Before you even marry, there's rights upon you to your future spouse and same sister or brother what is it the first one is before you marry that brother or sister before you marry that sister or brother you have rights what are the rights to choose the correct spouse to choose the correct spouse that is the right not just that is important that you have to do but rather your future offsprings inshallah have over you because you would have been the one to make that choice and what is something that should be the main headline or the main thing that you look for and inshallah we're going to go more into it is that a tadayun a tadayun wal akhlaq that you look for someone that has 
the deen. His number one or her number one priority is the deen of Islam. Because if they have that upon their forehead, that their number one thing, no matter what happens, whether they fall short with the gospel acts of worship, whether they fall short and make a mistake, if their deen is there, they have the deen established and they fear Allah Azza wa Jal, then inshallah, even if, even if, and they have of course good mannerisms, even if they don't have that love, natural love towards you as a brother or a sister, then they won't oppress or harm you. Why? Because the deen was there and established from day one. They have the deen. So therefore they fear Allah Azza wa Jal. If you fear Allah, you know your boundaries. Even though I don't have love for this person that I've married or what have you, they will end it if needed and they will make sure they give you your rights that you deserve. And same applies if they have mannerisms. They know how to deal with things in the correct manner. We've seen and heard of many stories that happen. Because of the fact that people don't have mannerisms, they don't fear Allah Azza wa Jal. So when you choose your spouse, make sure the first thing that you look for should be, of course, other th there are other things that we're going to cover, but meaning the main thing should be a tabayyun because that's what's going to last. Yes, you should be attracted to your spouse, without a doubt. Many a hadith have come to inform us of, of that. When the Messenger وسلم, advised the Sahabi that came to him and said that I'm going to marry so and so, he said, Did you look at her? And he said to the, he said to the Messenger, وسلم, No, he said, Go and look at her. Because, of course, you have to be attracted to that person, both husband and wife, not just one, it's not a one way. Uh, motorway, it's not just a one way, it's not one sided part, no, because you're going to both live with each other. So, if you do that and you choose the correct person, the main thing should be the deen because eventually we're all going to age. Something could happen to us, law qadr Allah, and our beauty could, in the beginning, of course, you get married to someone for and you're attracted to them. Let's say their beauty disappears, that's it, the relationship is over. That's not what's going to last, brothers and sisters. The main thing should be the deen, that should be the main thing. The second thing, so the first one is that you choose the correct person. The second thing is that there are rights during the process of you asking for that sister's hand in marriage. Okay, brothers, there is rights when you ask for that sister's hand in marriage. The third one, the rights during the actual nikah, when you're having the actual nikah. The other one is, the other right, or the fourth one is rights that you have upon each other when you have settled into your marriage. And another one is the rights when you have children. Let's say there's children now involved. Another, another, another rights that you have upon each other is when the children grow up. So I can go on and make a list, a whole bunch of lists of the rights, because people just believe it's just when we're married. No, it's more than that. Now, to elaborate, the rights of you when you choose a spouse. We're going to talk about the brothers side and also the sisters. The Prophet ﷺ, or كَمَا قَالَ لَبِيْثَ سَلَّمْ فِي الْحَدِيثِ الصَّحِيحِ تُنْكِحُ الْمَرْأَ لِأَرْبَعِينَ Okay, a woman should be selected and married for four things. لِمَالِهَا وَلِحَسَبِهَا وَلِجَمَالِهَا وَلِدِينَهَا فَانْظُرْ بِذَا تَدِّينَ تَرْبَتِ يَذَاكَ The hadith. From the first one is لِمَالِهَا Meaning her financial situation. Okay. Her status, her position, her beauty, and the deen. And it says, فَنْظُرْ بِذَاتِ deen, Meaning, look towards the deen. Make that be the first thing, the priority, the main thing that you look towards. And also, the one that doesn't really, the meaning of the hadith, meaning, may your hands be filled with dust, meaning you'll be a loser if you choose, other than the deen. Okay? Based upon the deen, brothers and sisters, we have to bear in mind, and we live in this society that we live in here in the West specifically and this day and age, the deen goes a long way. People don't realize some sisters or some brothers, same thing, but let's say sisters they choose or fathers specifically, this the fathers, a lot of them, maybe a man will come to them asking for their daughter's hand in marriage and he could be a man upon istiqama, upon steadfastness, he fears Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay, he has the means to get married, but he's not rich enough in, his, in the father's eyes. And the father chooses someone else who is a, a rich person. Now, tell me, let's say something was to be was to happen and they were afflicted with a test or trial or a tribulation. And that person doesn't fear Allah. For him, the main thing is that he has money. And the father thinks he's going to benefit because he's going to get some of that investment. Okay? Unfortunately, this is a sad reality. Now, the problem is, if something was to happen, brothers and sisters, in this situation where that man has given away his daughter 
to someone that just possesses money and he has no intent, intention or, or no himma, no importance for the akhirah, then he will oppress her. That's number one. Number two, he can even ask her to do things that are haram from them, taking interest, riba, and other things. And the blame will go back to the father. And the hadith to support that which I'm saying, كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ أَوْ فِي رِوَايَةٍ إِذَا خَطَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ If someone comes to you and another narration, if you have been addressed by a man coming to you to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, إِذَا خَطَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ What's the first thing the Prophet ﷺ said? If someone comes to you, O oh Father, and you have a daughter, and you want to get her married off, someone comes to you, and you are pleased with them with regards to their deen. They have taqwa, they fear Allah Azza wa Jal. You are pleased. مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ See, look at how it goes hand in hand. Because the Prophet ﷺ says in authentic hadith that I am like this to the one that perfects his mannerism, like this. كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث الصحيح إني بعثت لأتمم مكارم الأخلاق Verily I've been sent down to perfect good mannerisms So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in this hadith is telling us If someone comes to you And you are pleased with his deen And his mannerism, he has good conduct فزوجوه Then verily marry him to your daughter Accept, accept his offer for him asking you Okay فزوجوه إلا On some other hadith وإلا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ عَرِيدٌ رواه الترمذي If you don't do so, then you will spread about great evil because then you're basically making it difficult for that man to do something halal and he may be led to doing something which is haram and you will spread about a, a, a great facade upon this earth and all of this goes back down to how your mindset is What do you want? Do you want khair for your daughters? Do you want khair for your future grandchildren? That should be the number one priority that you should look towards when a man comes to you. So this here is proof for both sides with regards to choosing it and selecting the right spouse. And of course we have to bear in mind, of course the man has to be someone who's hardworking. He has a means to support and provide for your daughter. Okay? So that's another thing as well which is important. brothers. Many brothers want to get married and they say, oh, I'm ready for marriage, I want to implement the hadith. And they have no job, they have no investment, they have nothing. How are you going to be able to support that future wife of yours? So you have to bear in mind that you also have to be ready. You also have to be ready to be able to support your future wife. Now brothers and sisters, we should have the deen as our number one priority. We should always have the deen as our number one priority. Sisters, when someone does come to you, asking you, and for the fathers, before I mention sisters, for the fathers, it should be very simple. In this hadith, we can break it down. Man tardawna deenahu, a man has come to you. And this is also from the akhlaq of a brother. When you do go and ask for a sister's hand in marriage, and you go to their household, of course, from the rights is that they welcome you. And that's what generally speaking any father will do they'll welcome you with warm hands okay and they will bring you into their house which is a big thing to bring someone into your own private household it's something big so for them doing so from akhlaq from the akhlaq from the good conduct and good characteristics don't go to that house empty-handed sure you have himma and you have high importance that you're going to the house don't go empty-handed it's aib it is seen as something shameful that you're going to go to the house and you want to meet the family, as they say, first impressions last. So don't go empty-handed, wanting to speak to your future father-in-law to go and see your future wife. Go with something as a means of good characteristics, common courtesy. And also, of course, have respect with regards to when you have been welcomed into that house. Have respect to the household that you are about to enter. This is something very important. Many people, they do embark upon this journey and they want to get married, but they have no actual background knowledge as to what they're doing. They just go there, they eat the food, they leave, they don't say, Jazakh Allah khair, thank you very much, thank you very much for you know, hosting me and having me in your... These are basics, brothers. Basics. Basic things. Just like if someone wants to come to your house and they want to borrow something off you, they just come, take it and leave. It's seen as that. It's exactly as you're going to someone's house, you're going to take something from them and leave. You don't say, you don't say, can I? 
characteristics. The deen of Islam teaches us mannerisms. So this should be, some, this should be something that you do. When you go to the house, do not go empty-handed. Try and take something there. If they cook for you, then thank them. Praise them for that which they've done. You're already being in the good books with the gospel, the way the father looks at you. Because of course he wants to know, can I trust you as a person? You're a stranger to them. Even if you were to know, even if they know you, but for them it's like you're a stranger to take my, for me to just give you my daughter. So therefore you have to try and impress. You have to try and impress the family you're going into. Just the same way, picture yourself that if I was to have a daughter, and majority of the shabab sitting here are young, probably they won't know what that means, but once you do have a daughter and you, and you nurture that young girl and you look after them, then wallahi, then you would know how important it is this specific topic and this specific matter. Now during the nikah, the next right, during the actual nikah, there are rights. And from them, as the Prophet ﷺ came in the hadith of Sahih, لا نكاح إلا بولي. The sisters, before you embark upon this life, you have to make sure you have someone that represents you, someone that is responsible for you, your wali. Now, what is the benefit? Why did the Prophet ﷺ make this? And another narration, the Prophet ﷺ informs us and tells us that there is no nikah without a wali, meaning it is batil. If the sister goes and gets married without a wali, many cases you see a sister, specifically the revert sisters. If you are going to get married, we're not saying take your father, let's say your father is non-Muslim, this could be the case. Of course he can't be with the wali. Let's say you get the imam to be the wali. Have your father present there to meet that man that inshallah is going to be your future husband. No qaddar Allah, let's say something happened, we don't wish this for anyone. But let's say that man 10 years down the line was to oppress you and to mistreat you. At least your father was there from the get-go, he knows who this person is, he can be there. Because unfortunately, or billah, or tallah, unfortunately, many brothers don't fear Allah. Especially when they go into the households that have no man present there. They don't fear Allah Azza wa Jal, and they treat the woman the way they want. And unfortunately, because of that, because the woman didn't have a really to start with and begin with, they mistreat them. But let's say, and I'm speaking from experience, let's say me thinking back many years before I got married, to walk into that household and I see a man, a father, and I see, let's say, the brother of the sister, my future wife, how dare I think of doing something evil? Because I'm seeing a man in front of me. So therefore I know subhan, this is a man. Let's say put fear of Allah to the side. That should come anyway. Just thinking about it, you're seeing a man present in the house, you know subhanAllah, you know what? I need to make sure I you know, treat this woman correctly. Because this is the person I'm going to have to go and answer back to in case I don't. So that's why it's important and incumbent upon the sisters to make sure you have someone there that represents you from your family household. And this is something that we know is important because the Prophet ﷺ told us, and for the sisters as well, you have to bear in mind, you know, and, and know that لا نكاح إلا بولي. There is no nikah except for the wali being present. This is from the rights that you have over your husband, that you have a wali present there. Another thing is the mahr. Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran, وَآتُ النِّسَاء صَدَقَاتِهِنَّ نِحْلَةً Okay, and give to the woman, give to the woman when you marry, when you marry them, their obligation, which is the bridal money, okay? And when the, Allah mentions in the Quran, when you look at the tafsir of this ayah and the ahadith, it's mentioned that this is something that should be selected and chosen from whom? From the fathers? It's a question. Should, it, should the mahar be chosen from the father or by the father? Huh? Barakallahu from the sister, from the wife, from the future wife. Many cultures have it differently. However, the actual correct way is that the wife is the one that chooses because this is her haq. This is her right that she has over her husband. So she chooses it. Okay, she shouldn't be talked into something. No, she chooses it. Anything extra or contra, no problem. But she chooses that. And this also, as you can see, is something that the Prophet Sallallahu when a man came and was a poor companion, he came to the Prophet ﷺ saying to him that he has nothing, he's going to marry some, uh, 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 his future wife. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you have anything? And he went back to look three, four times and then he told the Prophet ﷺ that he, hasn't had, he doesn't have anything in terms of you know, uh, wealth to give the sister, his future wife. So the Prophet ﷺ informed his companion, then teach her from something you know from the Qur'an to show that it is important to give something. This is from her rights. 
And then we should also know as well that from the rights that the husband or the future son-in-law has over the family members is that they don't make it difficult. Brothers and sisters, we live in a day and age where for some or for many it is tough for them to be able to come up with 15,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds. If you have these type of conditions because of your culture and you put Islam to the side and you, you, know, you have your culture uh, preceding Islam, then you're going to make it very difficult for your daughter to get married to anyone and generally for that man that could be khair, he could bring about khair into your household and you don't know because of the fact that he fears Allah, he has something to give but not that much, 15, 20, 30, 50 it shouldn't be a thing where, and unfortunately some have this mindset, whether they admit it or not you're not selling your daughter, okay, it's not some sort of bay or shira okay, your daughter is going away have of course something that you see as right but she chooses it of course she chooses it but don't make it difficult because if you make it difficult and I've seen many and I know some unfortunately they, it was made difficult upon them to marry a specific sister and they both wanted to get married and unfortunately the brother fell short with regards to his iman and he went to do that which Allah did not prohibit or Allah made haram and this is something that we know in this day and age we live in today, we shouldn't see it as something that it's a must for us to, you know, uh, make it, um, you know, uh, an obligation to the man coming to ask for your hand, for, for your daughter's hand. So try and make it easy that way, inshallah, a lot of khair can come about. From the rights, of course, we know, is that we should all bear in mind that the way that the actual nikah should occur, is that a man calls and speaks to the wali okay not speaking to the sister directly not speaking to the sister directly or privately on messenger or instagram and what have you all these blind dates and going out for, with 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 that specific ajnabi man this shouldn't be the case it should be rather the islamic way it should be the islamic way and many people say but how can i go into such a relationship when i don't know the person very simple you like each other the man goes and directly speaks to your wali, your father, your uncle. If you've agreed and both parties have agreed, do the nikah and don't consummate the marriage. You can go on dates, as many dates as you want. You've done it in a halal way. You've done it in a halal way. And then you can get to know each other. But to do it the opposite way where you go and go on dates and what have you, all of this, no, la khair ala. There is no khair or goodness within this. From the rights is that, of course, both parties see each other both parties see each other so the woman sees the man and the man sees the woman this is from the rights as well that they have so that and what's the reason brothers and sisters we're going to mention it later but from them is that when you marry someone that you're attracted to after putting in mind the deen and her akhlaq and his akhlaq and whatever then she will help you and he will help her he will help you in lowering your gaze that should be the reason that you're able to stay with each other Okay, and you're attracted to one another during the actual wedding. Now, these are the things that go back down to culture with regards to setting up the hall and what have you and gifts. But from the rights is that you start your wedding or your day, that big day, in a halal way. No music, no free mixing, none of that. You start it in a halal way. So this can, you can start that life and embark upon that journey with barakah from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah, Allah the Almighty mentions in his noble book and live with them in peace and harmony and goodness live with your wife in peace and harmony and goodness this should be the way and state of each and every single one of us we should live with our women folk with peace and harmony and affection and how can one do so from the first specific time when you live with them you are patient with them Okay, the Prophet sallallahu said an authentic hadith, and listen to this hadith: Fattakullaha fin nisa, and fear Allah regarding women. That's the first thing he said. When, what does this mean? Meaning, in your day-to-day -day life, from the moment you get married until you are separated with death or whatever it may be. Fattakullaha fin nisa. The Prophet sallallahu didn't just stop there, because he's advising. Us with regards to the way we should treat our women folk. For in the kum, verily you have a khaftumuhunna bi amanillah. 
Verily, you have taken them. Okay, you have taken them. They were given to you by their walis. You have taken them, i.e., in terms of marriage, as a trust from Allah Azza wa Jal. فَإِنَّكُمْ أَخَذْتُمُهُنَّ بِأَمَانِ اللَّهِ You have taken them as a trust from their walis, from Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? وَاسْتَحْلَلْتُمْ فُرُوجَهُنَّ بِكَلِمَةِ اللَّهِ And also, intimacy has been made lawful by the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. رَوَاهُ مُسْلِمْ This hadith. So with this hadith, we should bear in mind and we should know that the Prophet Sallallahu informed us that the woman they were created from a rib. Okay, the rib cage. We all know the hadith. If you try to straighten it, you will break it. If you leave it, it will remain awaj. So, فَاسْتَوْصُوا nisa. فَاسْتَوْصُوا nisa, And be kind to the woman folk. Because they are different towards you with regards to their emotions. Okay, so be kind towards them. And Allah, if we try to implement the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and try to be the way the Prophet Sallallahu was, then we will live and have houses of bliss and rahmah, mercy and tranquility, sakina and just beauty with regards to the house. That's how the house would be if we are the way the Prophet ﷺ was with his wives. And the next right is when the marriage has been established and you started to live t with each other. This should be the case, this, that which I mentioned. Also, an authentic hadith where Prophet ﷺ says, الدُّنْيَا مَتَاعٍ وَخَيْرُ مَتَاعِهَا الْمَرْأَ الصَّالِحَا الْمَرْأَةُ الصَّالِحَا That this world is nothing but what? Enjoyment. Okay? And the best of enjoyments are from this world is a righteous wife. So that's why you choose from get go a righteous wife. And same applies for the sisters. You choose a righteous husband. That he can be like or he can try and implement the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ was with his wives and also the wife, the sisters can be like the Sahabiyat or the Ummahat al Mu'mineen. Now, a woman, of course, we know that she should be, when her husband sees her, she should please him. And when her husband is with her, she should obey him. And she should not adopt a manner about her chastity and in a bad way that which angers her husband. But the same also applies to the husband brothers. The same applies also to the husband. You should be with your wife when she sees you and she's happy with you. When you say things, you bring about joy and rahmah and mercy towards the way she feels about herself and to, towards you. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned an authentic hadith, خيركم, خيركم لأهلي, wa ana خيركم لأهلي. That the best of you, the best of you, who's the best of you? Are the ones that are best to their family house, their family, their wife and children. And I am the best with regards to, amongst you, with regards to my family. So Prophet is t telling us all of these ahadith. Not once did we hear, and we live in this day, unfortunately, many brothers, you see them when they come to the masajid, Safal awwal, mashallah, half of the kitab, illa, maybe even. Safal awwal, he's in the first line. He's coming, he's giving salam to the brothers. You, you see him when he comes into the masjid, he's like a moon. It's like a moon is coming, it's smiling. And when he enters his house, it's like an asid, like a lion. He hits his wife, he abuses her mentally, physically. Not once did we hear this from the Prophet ﷺ that he did so. Even when his wife angered him. What did he do in that famous qissa that we know? He left them for, for, some, for some period of time and he went somewhere else. So he was, and even though it was their actions that angered him, it wasn't him. But he left. He left and he went somewhere else. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that we should be kind to our women folk. So, Taqullah, ya ayyuhal rijal. Fear Allah Azza wa Jal with regards to your women folk. If you are a true man, then you would not even think about laying your hand, even thinking about it towards your wife, even if she angers you. Because this does not prove that you're a man, but rather it proves you're a coward. So, you should fear Allah Azza wa Jal. It has to stop this abuse that goes on in the household, not just because of the fact that you're literally breaking this woman. It's not just that, but specifically more even when you have children in the household. Because now you're making them grow up in this toxic environment. So we have to bear in mind and know that we should be kind towards our women folk. The Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, and of course, this also applies to the woman. Of course, it applies to the woman as well that they should be kind towards their husbands. 
Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And they, the women, have rights, okay, over their husbands as regards to living expenses and other things, similar to those of their husbands, over them as regards to obedience and respect. Now, listen to what Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said with regards to this verse, okay? Listen closely. قال ابن عباس في تفسير هذه الآية إني لا أتزين لامرأتي كما تتزين لي إني لا أتزين لامرأتي Verily I adorn myself and I present myself I make myself look presentable towards my wife the same way she does for me It's a two-way relationship She, you expect her and this should be something that she does She adorns herself and looks in a beautiful manner for you why? So that it helps you, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, And another hadith, another and next ayah, And tell the believing men in the first one and the second one, the believing women to lower their gaze and to protect their private parts. Now the easiest way is when you're married that your wife makes herself look presentable for you. Okay, she beautifies herself. She beautifies herself. The same applies for you as a man, that you should beautify yourself for and in front of your wife. And another thing as well, because think about it, it's very simple. The reason why you got married, and the Prophet says, basar. Okay, it helps you protect yourself from evil. Hence why nikah was made halal for us. Let's say you got married. And unfortunately, this does happen. In the beginning, you both try to adorn yourself and make yourself look beautiful for each other. When kids come in, get in the picture and what have you, you find that either of the two start to just, you know, let themselves go, unfortunately. Okay, with regards to their appearance, they just let themselves go. It's like, okay, I've had my... No, this shouldn't be the case. This shouldn't be the case, but rather it should be that you keep yourself looking in a presentable, fashionable manner for your spouse. And a means of this is keeping fit, okay? Keeping fit and keeping yourself look, looking attractive for your spouse. As this was the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. And you play with each other and you speak kind words and you have fun with each other. This should be the way that one should do. This should be the way that... This should be the way that one should be with regards to his spouse, both sides of the party. And also, if you have... Uh, differences with regards to many even if it's regards to normal day-to-day -day life then you should return it back to Allah as Allah mentions in the Quran and if you differ in anything then return it back to Allah and his messenger you should always bear in mind that if you know that you're going to get angry and you have returned it back to Allah and his messenger then walk out be the better person and walk out and don't let yourself be in a situation where you will regret it. Don't put yourself in a predicament that you will regret in the future. And inshallah, I'm going to end on a couple of notes. We should know the Prophet ﷺ, how kind was he to his wives? Two different hadith, and we mentioned it yesterday, where the Prophet ﷺ raised Aisha radiallahu anha. Okay, one of them when he was a bit younger, another one when he was a bit older. And when he raised his wife the second time, some narrations mentioned that he beat her the first, or the other narrations mentioned that he beat her the first. That he said to her, هَذَا لتلك, Meaning, this one is for the first time when you beat me. So he's a man at this moment of time when he's above his 50s. But he's still taking time. And in the narrations it's mentioned that he's taking and leading his army for a battle. And he still has the time to what? To race his wife and have fun with her. Another hadith mentioned that Aisha radiallahu anha said that at times the Prophet sallallahu would rest his head on her lap and she would comb his hair. All of this are ways that you can make yourself have a better relationship when you're together, living together. And in another narration is mentioned when Aisha radiallahu anha would drink from a specific part of the glass or the cup, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would take it and drink from the same part just to show that love and affection with regards to that which he had for his wife. So we should try and live together, brothers. The whole, top, the whole point of why we bought this ahadith and these uh, points was to, to try and just make a reminder, as Allah mentions in the Quran, for dhikr, for inna dhikratun fa'ul mu'mineen. We should remind ourselves and know 
and inshallah and on that note but we should have just know and bear in mind the main way that a relationship is successful is التفاهم, having understanding with regards to one another and ihtiram respect respecting one another you respect each other and التدين, having that deen as the main thing that keeps you both going and also akhlaq having good mannerisms and we should try and be good with one another and live the same way the Prophet Sallallahu lived and fearing Allah Azza wa Jal at all times and due to time we end it there Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een May Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all and may Allah Azza wa Jal enable us all to live and have good households where we implement that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam implemented wa akhid da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen